Looks good. Okay, cool. So listen, I'm just going to try to give you a practical approach to spine trauma. There's a lot to cover. I wasn't given a scope as to what I should talk to you about, said intermediate training, etc. But I'm going to give you a practical approach to cervical, thoraco, and lumbar trauma. So before we even start looking at that, we just have to recap on these very important concepts. Um, on the history, mechanism of injury is very important because it sort of describes how much power and force has gone through the spine. Pain, when you're looking at pain, you have to be very specific as to what dermatome is affected. And remember, patients will tell you my arm is sore or my foot is sore. You have to be very, very specific to say, is it your thumb? Is it your middle finger? Because that's how you start mapping where the problem is in the spine. So be specific with pain. Pain in the neck, obviously local pain is a big red flag. It's because they've got pain in the neck or they've got pain on movement. You also worry that's hinting towards something going on in the spine. Nerve symptoms, these can range from being very subtle. So you're looking at stuff like um, paresthesia, just some tingling, that is, although subtle, is still very significant. You know, if someone's had neck trauma and they say they've got tingling in their fingers, don't ignore that. Look further. And then uh, the radicular pain, exactly down at dermatome. And then if they tell you they can't move their leg or they can't move their finger, listen to the patient, don't brush it off. But remember, all of these things must be put all together, as in you say, there is spine trauma, the patient then has pain, then he's got some paresthesia. You know, in that patient, then you must have a high index of suspicion. Obviously, you always ask about um, bladder and bowel, you know, any incontinence. And remember the other sign in spine trauma, a very bad prognostic sign. If a guy's got a preopism and he presents with a preopism, that's already a sign of significant spinal cord injury. And concomitant injuries also just show you how serious the, the trauma is and how bad the force that's gone through the patient's body. So I'm, I'm stressing this again. Dermatomes and myotomes are very important. You can't assess the spine unless you know this. And there's no other way to know them except to keep on you know, going through them and reading them. And, and when you ask spine history, be specific and try to keep it dermatomal because that'll give you level or myotomal. That gives you level. And in spine, we always say, the lesion or the pathology must match the dermatome. Otherwise, something else is going on. On an examination, log roll is very important. You guys know all of this. I'm just recapping quickly. Log roll and spinal precaution. A log roll needs four people at minimum. Um, you can have five, that's a bonus. Five is the other guy to doing the actual examination. Um, when you're looking locally, this local exam is the hallmark of your spinal examination because this will tell you and it will give you clues to instability. Those clues are tenderness, bogginess on the spine. So any big swollen, fluctuant area over the midline associated with trauma is a red flag. Crepitus, obviously it's a sign of uh, fracture and broken bones. And now steps and gapping or gaping. So if you've got a step, that means something has moved forward. However, if the interspinous distance between two levels is increased, that's also indicative of a posterior tension band injury. So you have to turn the patient over and you have to examine the back. All right, you have to, I will always ask you as that, because that will also lead you down the treatment algorithm. And normally if you've got a three column injury and you can palpate on the back, that spine is unstable and that will lead to a need to surgical fixation. Your neurological exam always do is not just sense and motor, include your reflexes. And a patient now recently came from a Mitchell's plane, I think. Yep. Another one, no, no, another one. This is an old guy, he's come from Mitchell's plane, he's had an MRI in Mitchell's plane. Everyone says this guy is motor intact and sensor intact, so it's neurologically normal. No one has checked reflexes or no one has checked tone. So it has a vital injury. MRI confirmed it showed a um, cord signal. But if you examine the guy, he's got increased reflexes. He had increased biceps, triceps. 
He had a Hoffman sign that was positive. He had um, increased tone. He had abnormal gait. So he had myelopathy. So you can't assess the spine if you haven't gone through reflexes. And your special tests like Hoffman's, upgoing planters, always check for that. As well, on your neurological exam, part of assessing a patient that has spinal cord injury is doing a PR. And while you're doing a PR, you might as well do the bulbal cavernosus reflex. So that's specifically something we leave for patients who have a, a spinal cord injury, so that's a central injury. And in that, you either put your finger in the, in the, in the, do a PR, and you either squeeze the glands or the bulbus, or you pull on the catheter, and they should get a corresponding uh, anal, anal contraction. If that doesn't happen, it means that the patient's in spinal shock. So why, what I do, while the patient is log rolled, I feel all the way from the top of the spine, all the way down, and I do a PR at that moment, and then I'll do my bubble cavernosis. At that moment, then it's done. Then you flip the patient back. Remember something else? You must take off that collar. You can't examine a patient with a collar. You take it off, you do uh, C-spine immobilization, and so that you can make sure you don't miss anything. Always look for associated injuries. The Mitchell's plane patient that we're talking about, Missed unstable spine, missed sternal fracture. Quite a bad sternal fracture was missed by, by Mitchell's plane. So that just patient was telling them she's got tender at the back and she's tender at the front. And that signifies quite a high velocity injury. That's a fourth column injury. And you know, it, it also implies that the, there's the probable lung contusions or cardio contusion, and this patient is actually very ill and should not be able to explain. So look for other associated injuries, or if you've got a thoracolumbar injury, if they've got a thoracolumbar trans fracture, you have to imagine that spine has been flexed over the abdomen. Watch out for any abdominal injury, hollow organ injuries. Again, a PR is mandatory, and watch out for any bladder or any other perineal injuries. Now, specifically looking at the cervical spine, I think we need to start at the beginning. I put this in here because this is fifth year station one. We all should know it, but this is what we ask all fifth years in station one, and they've memorized this. And with time, we always forget, you know. So good x-rays have to include C0 to T1. That's an adequate uh, C-spine x-ray. Summer's view to C T1. Open mouth view to see the one, two, and then an AP view. Don't forget, we say three views, which is the standard that we get, which is your AP, your lateral, and your open mouth. But ideally, you want five views. Those are your lateral obliques. So your right oblique and your left oblique will make your fourth and fifth views. But our standards are three, are three views. This is something that I think you guys should know because you'll get asked this a lot. Which patient should be x-rayed? And you tell them you're not the radiologist. They've got their own trauma protocols. But then they'll phone you and say, I've got a patient with a C-spine. So the Nexus criteria is described in 1998 by Hoffman. And then they say x-ray is not required if any of these things are there. And it's the obvious no midline tenderness, no evidence of intoxication, awake and alert, and no neurological fallout, and no painful distraction injuries. So Nexus was good, but then the Steel et al. in 2001, 2001, they came up with the Canadian C-spine rule. This was found to be more specific than Nexus because it added a high risk category. Welcome, Joe. We've just gone through the beginning. You haven't missed much. So the Canadian c rule added this, this category, which is good because it then sort of talked about the patients with the paresthesia. Do not let that patient go. Age more than 65 is important because the grannies, although the x-rays or although they may seem fine, they get discoligamentous injuries that may be missed, so be careful of them. And the mechanism, again, mechanism of injury implies the type of, or alludes to the type of, of forces that have gone through the spine. So, trauma will phone you and say, what should, who should get the x-ray? You say, guys, you've been taught your Canadian C-spinal, use it and apply it, you're not the radiologist, but if they ask you who should get, or you wanna know who should get, you can apply these rules too. But anyway, we also pods. If, if anyone phones us, do not phone me without a C-spine X-ray. 
That's what I used to tell them because, I mean, there's no point in calling me unless you're worried about something. Just to go through the lines of the C-spine, um, very quickly, soft tissue line, anterior body line, posterior body line. Um, don't forget the spinal laminar line and the lines of convergence are not drawn in here. So all these lines are hints that something's gone wrong. If there's a step in any of the lines, it's showing you that something has shifted. For something to shift, it means that a functional spinal unit has been disrupted. So that means that there's either a break in the pause, a break in the facet, or there's just a proper dislocation where something has jumped forward. So the lines and the soft tissue shadow or the soft tissue area, they're there to hint that something's gone wrong. You know, you then have to then quantify and say the dislocation is a refracture, but use those lines, they're good first line glances of seeing is there something wrong with the C spine. Open mouth view, very, very good. Um, as you can see, the most important part, the starred area. So that's the area around the peg. That should be equidistant on both sides. More importantly, the area in the red circles, that area, the combined sum of that lateral mass overhang should be not more than 6.9. We can say seven, run it off to seven. And that's the rule of Spence. So if that is widened or it's increased the combined sum more than 6.9, that's showing you that there's a damage to either the TAL, the transverse ligament, or there's a fracture in the lateral mass causing wide widening. So that's used to assess the relationship of C1 onto C2. And it's a, you need the open mouth view. It's to be centered over, as you can see, this is a very nicely done one. Centered over the center of the mouth and you have to be able to appreciate and get this view. So if any of this is, is, is abnormal, you then worry and then can ask for a CT. On the AP view, you always forget to look at it. The AP shows good things. You look at the spinous processes in particular, they should always be in a line. So if there's any rotation, the spinous processes will be off center. If there's any lysthesis or coronal shifts off center, and those are implying significant pathology. So we'll always forget. And another thing you can see on the front, you can see pedicles, you can see how the facets are in relation to each other. You can see the uncle virtual joints, but for trauma purposes, don't, Ignore the AP. There's a lot of information on the AP. Now, this is a concept that I think that, I mean, at, at your level, you shouldn't really know much into it. But come on, guys, you guys are basically registrars already. You're in the program, you're on the conveyor belt. And I didn't want to just like sort of dumb it down for you. This is information that's good. This is how you're going to assess is the C spine stable or not? The most important thing on this slide is that last point, that last bullet. So when you are assessing a C-spine and you see translation of the vertebral bodies of more than 3.5 millimeters, or there's more than 11 degrees of angulation, this implies the loss of disc integrity and therefore instability. So basically what happened in 1987, Punjabi and White, they did, they looked at a whole lot of cadavers and did a whole lot of modeling to see at which point was this disc defunct, which point was the spine unstable. And they found that at those parameters on a normal x-ray, more than 3.5 mils, I'm repeating it again because it's very important, more than 3.5 mils or more than 11 degrees of angulation in that area is indicative of a damaged disc and instability. Okay. So if you've got those two, something there's a big problem, that patient requires fixation. Then the rest of it is talking about, it's not just an absolute score or an absolute figure. You actually work it out and it's looking at other parameters, whether the anterior elements or the posterior elements, positive stress test, all of those you add them up, give them a score. A score that more than five equals instability. But I think for you guys, when you're dealing with your patients in the trauma in the front room, if you see any of those at that bottom point, you know it's unstable, it needs reduction and you need to send it across for fixation. C1 fracture, just to go through quickly, this is a very good diagram because 
it basically gives you all the things that can go wrong with C1. The advantage of C1 is that most of the time when there's an injury, it's normally it opens up the canal. You know, basically, if you have an injury there, it's either you're dead or you're alive because uh, it's not conducive to life if you've got a spinal cord injury. But the, the nature of the ring injury it normally bursts open. So your Jefferson is in the red lines, lateral mass is there, and your bony avulsion, remember, can be either intra-substance in the green, or it can be a bony pull-off. And a bony pull-off always does better because you know bone heals better, and the intra-substance ligament that one may need fixation. So just be able to identify the C1 fractures. And remember, you guys won't be doing any of this. For today's time is only for you guys to identify and to refer the patients on. And, and as you can see in that picture next to that x-ray, that lateral mass overhang is more, if you add up both sides, is more than 6.9. So that's showing you that there's something going on that the patient probably needs fixation. Send them up the road. I'll put this in because you'll see the registrars still get killed on this. Um, you can, everyone calls a C2 a hangman's fracture, but that's a misnomer. A hangman's fracture is caused by a sudden distractive force on a hyperextended neck. So that's a true hangman, someone who's been hung off a rope from his neck. What we see, and the, the, the thing that you see in your trauma unit from a car, from whatever, it's not a hangman. It's called the traumatic spondylolisthesis of the axis. Professor Dunn and Alice Van Oost published a lot on this a while ago, and he is very, very particular. And I also agree, they're completely different mechanisms of injury. So calling it a hangman just shows you that you're not clued up and it just it's not slick. So it's a TSA, and it's an axial load on a hyperextended or a flexed neck. You know, and that foresight mechanism sort of describes it. You guys don't have to know this, but you must just know that the neck is either in a fixed position, either it's hyperextended or it's hyperflexed. Then it gets loaded. And as it gets loaded, this then causes an axial rotational type of translated force. So like getting crunched down, it's already in an extended or, or a flexed position. And then that loading further causes us to shear. That then leads to the most typical fracture, which is a pars interarticularis type fracture. So pars interarticularis of C2. Okay. So that is the that is what it looks like, and you will see that. And the pars is that area between. I don't know if you guys can see it on your, you won't be able to see it, but you can see. Let's just go through our lines quickly. There's a step in the C2, 3 line. You can see the obvious steps. So something has broken. The fracture has occurred. It's a fracture because the, why do you say it's fractured? The posterior elements are left behind. The anterior elements are left somewhere else. So something has broken. If it wasn't fractured, either the whole posterior elements and the body would have moved forward. So there's a break there. So that area there, that's the part of C2. And that's where it's broken. And that is your traumatic spondylolisthesis of the axis. And that is what you will see because you hardly see hangings. Unless the patient, unless I've said you, the patient has hung, that mechanism does not exist. Okay. Classification. It's just a quick, quick brief on classification so that you know because classification has a lot to do with um, treatment. Type one, that's why I said this, this less than 3.5, more than 11 degrees. It's extrapolated to a lot of classifications and a lot of descriptions of disc integrity or stability. So a lot of guys will use it in all the other classifications, a lot of it because it's already been proven that it shows. So 3.5 is the magic number, less than 3.5 with no angulation, it's a type one, you can put it in cones. Type two, um, depending on if you can get a good reduction. So type two and type two A, so type two and type, Three, depending on if you can get a good reduction, you can keep in cones and they'll heal and they'll do well. Type 2A is the one you've got to worry about, okay? Because type 2A, what happens is it's more a distractive force. So by putting it in cones, 
you will cause worse of a problem. So it'll just open up. You'll open up the two, three space and you'll actually cause significant damage or spinal cord injury to the patient. So be careful for that one that's got no translation but severe annulation. That's implying that something else has gone on. And it's also it's a different, it's a completely different mechanism to, to how it's happened. Um, so just for you guys to know, I think it's it's unfair. You guys might think you're getting away with it now. The fact that there's no cones at Mitchells and Somerset and Victoria, it doesn't work in your favor because when you get here, I remember my first calls, you're like, shit, okay, I've got to put on cones. You haven't really done it and you're not experiencing, you have to do a lot of them. You see them on your call, you're the one putting them on. The other thing with cones is we're trying to create a protocol that everywhere, that even in a clinic, they need to have cones. It's a, it's a life changing procedure, being able to reduce something and stabilize something. I mean, it, it, it's so important. And you can see from that big trial that's come out, that four hour rule, that the young rugby player was on the field, there were no cones or no cones. But I'll tell you now, you go to some private hospitals, you won't find cones. So it's not just in our system, but it's at a disadvantage. And I'm talking to Stefan and Jeannie about, about you guys putting on cones in. And once you do it, I mean, it's, it's very easy and you get comfortable with it. Okay, just looking at sub-axial C-spine classification. The old school one, Alan Ferguson. It's nice because it's mechanistic. You can either say it's either extension alone or it can be distraction on an extended neck or it can be compression on an extended neck. So it's all depending on what position the neck was in and as the force was applied. It's very nice and it's been used for many years. However, the problem is it doesn't talk about facet joints, which is you'll see there's a lot. So what's happened to the facets? Are they fractured? And it sometimes can be misleading. It's not that great into observer. So the AO, which is what I'm now punching a lot, the AO has helped us a lot because they have created, just with all the classification, a simpler way. And this was done by Vakar and them in 2016. So it's quite new, but in our unit, we're expecting all the guys to know it. And as with all classifications, make sure you be able to speak to the other orthopod on the other line and say what's wrong. The nice thing about AO is that you might not know all of this, but they give you a nice algorithm to go through. But I'll just simply say, type A's are normally stable. Type B's unstable, type C most likely definitely unstable because any type C you've got translation and that's unstable. Any type B you've got disruption of either an anterior or a posterior tension band. So this is a concept that we're going to go through in this and in the thoracolumbar because I think A is simplified and very nice. A is to a specific part of the spine, either to the body or to the posterior elements. And when you're looking at the posture element, you're talking about spinous process, which is the A naught. Then A1 to A4 is specific to the body, what's happened. But it's not talking about anything happening to the back. Then you get to B. B is not talking about the tension band. The most problematic and the most common are post disruption of the, the posture tension band. Whereas a B3 is a hyperextension injury and you've got disruption of the anterior. So anterior tension band injury. I like the BL component because talking about whether it's bilateral or not. Remember, sometimes you can get just a jumped facet on one side. But type C, if there's any translation, you fall into a certain part. And AO has added the F component. So as with all things, you don't have to know exactly at your level, but you have to be able to say, look it up first, recognize, know there's a classification for it, recognize, and while you're making the phone call, could busy look it up and say to the guy, I've got this patient, I'm sending him across. If you tell a person you've got a type B2 cervical spine, no one's going to ask, answer, answer any questions, send it across. These are just more descriptors and modifiers for that. But what I like about A is all the classification have got this algorithm, which helps a lot. So you say, is the, you start, is there any displacement or dislocation? Yes, then it's automatically type C. Then you move down. Is there tension band injury? If it is, then it's a type B. And depending whether it's anterior or posterior, you want two or three. If it's just a virtual body fracture, it's either A1 to four, 
if it's just a process fracture, it's an A0. So this algorithm is what seals it for me because it helps me look at the x-ray and put the patient in cl and classify injury immediately. Another thing you'll be asked a lot of flex and extension, should you, should you not? So it's very useful in the patient who's got normal x-rays, but you're still not convinced, you're worried and you're concerned. However, this patient must have a normal level of consciousness and there must be no neurological fallout. And the patient moves. You don't move the patient. So it's an active movement by the patient. You ask them to flex and extend. And um, Insicos found that for them to be useful, you need more than 30 degrees of flexion or, or more than a 30 degree arc for you to say is it a stability or none. And so what you're trying to mimic or what you're trying to show is by either flexion or extension, is there a change of that 3.5 millimeters? Is there a change of that 11 degrees? Then you know something's gone, I have to do something. Okay, there's a guy who was referred to me from which is clear. No, you guys are lucky. Not you this time. This is last week. Vestlia. You go to Vestlia two weeks ago, and you can't blame them. Two weeks ago on the x ray, there's a little bit of kyphosis, focal kyphosis, but you have to look hard. But I'm sure he had neck pain, but no one really is busy, etc. He comes back two weeks later, it's completely off. You know, it's like, luckily, he's neurologically intact. Now you ask yourself, should they have done a flexis? If you're in doubt, you don't know. Two weeks, one or two weeks, give them five days, give them whatever. I know we say, give them two weeks, I'll see them in two weeks and I'll do a flex x in the clinic. I'm in doubt, I don't have time for the MRI, I don't have enough hard signs for the MRI. Uh, put on a collar, so still protect the spine, come back in two weeks, we'll do a flex x and we'll see. Remember, the biggest force that's gone through is the force in the road or wherever. You moving the patient, you've got very little chance of causing further problems. Especially a patient who's walking, who's got awake, oh, no neurological fallout. You can't cause more harm by doing the flex X in a safe environment as long as you make those parameters that I've talked about. Um, just this question will be asked, you know, who should get what? Extra CT. So the Spinal Cord Society, they established a panel. They looked at all literature from 1980 to 2017. Out of these 20,000 articles, they narrowed down to 105 articles. This was to try and decide to what should we do? Who should get an X-ray? Who should get a CT scan? Who should get an MRI? So we know, unfortunately, all modern trauma centers or units, they use CT scans for any suspicious C-span or anything. And this was further, you know, in 1990, they found that obviously CT scan had 90% sensitivity. Um, Griffin in 2003, they found that X-ray alone missed 35% of injuries. And then Diaz and them found that CT had a more sensitivity for ligamentous injury. So CT is good, it's easy to get, no one fights you for a CT scan. And you'll get that. If you're in any doubt, it's time to do a CT. If a trauma call, if a trauma, if one of the trauma people find you and say, ah, oh, they've got a suspicious C spine, so do a CT scan. You can you can quote that and just say, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah. Oh. If you're in doubt, if there's nothing obvious, the only way is to do a CT scan. If you're really in doubt, then we'll do an MRI. But the trauma units also have to understand they must do their part. You are the orthopedic surgeon, that's where the patient's ending up. But the trauma, I remember I used to get a lot of those phone calls. Won't you look at this x-ray for me? Won't you do this? And you say, look, do you think there's a problem? And you've done a clinical exam, is there any logical fallout? Why are you suspicious in the x-ray? If not, get a CT. I don't know who's at Somerset now. Josh, are you at Somerset? Who's the radiologist there now? Are they easy? Do they give CT scans easy or what are they doing? They give you a CT scan and a report. Yeah, then you just do the CT scan. It's fine. Just tell John, do the CT scan because then you can see. But in the CT, remember, you can also miss stuff on CT. So here's the last thing. So MRI, who gets an MRI? Obviously, any patient with neurological symptoms. And I will tell you, Paris easier for me post a cervical spine injury, that requires an MRI. So disc or ligamentous injury and, and soft tissue set, you can't see the disc on an X-ray. Yes, you can see those other indicators, the millimeters and the angulation. But if you really wanna see 
the whole picture, or you want to assess the back and see if the, if the muscles torn or and the degree of injury and MRI to go. The grannies, be careful of the grannies. The grannies, any patient with spondylotic C spine, their spine is rigid and they've got little weak points. And those weak points are normally the disc, the disc ligamentous area. So the disc level, and that's where they break through. So the grannies will have a spine that looks lots of osteophytes. You can't see, it looks like nothing's moved. But if you do an MRI, you'll see signal within the disc, you'll see signal within the posterior element. So in those patients that you are concerned, the grannies, and they've got posterior tenderness, and you're just not happy, there's no harm in even getting an MRI and a delay. It doesn't have to be that weakened, but if you are worried, no one will ever fault you for getting an MRI. And for your guys, because if anyone, I always used to say, I would rather phone and request MRI and let it be the radiologist be the one who cancels and says, I'm not going to give the MRI because then they're the ones who are going to be in shit. As long as you've documented your notes, I phoned this person for an MRI and they declined me. And then when we pick it up, we'll be able to find out where the problem was. As long as you followed your teaching and your goals, no one can fault you. The uptunded patients, this is a tricky one, okay? So they found that 20% in 2002 Ghana, and they found, Ganta, sorry, they found 20% with a negative CT had an abnormal MRI. This was further confirmed by Stassen and Sarani that there are those patients with a normal CT who have an abnormal MRI. The only safe thing for us is that in these patients, most of the time they didn't require any surgical intervention. But the obtained C spine cannot be cleared. You cannot clear that C spine. So if you're worried, put the patient in, in a filly collar or cones or just some form of immobilization until they're awake, until you can clear that C spine. Okay. And then obviously, where you've got x rays and CT that are inconclusive and something is not adding up. Like I had a patient now, she fell, she bumped her neck, she's elderly. She's got severe pain. She's got hyperesthesia. She's just like, things are not adding up. In that case, I want an MRI because I want an objective way to assess any spinal cord injury or any root, no root injury, any disc or whatever. So it's the only objective way. Yes, there's always the, the thought of cost, but think about it this way. The cost to the system will be far more if you miss some an injury that results in severe neurological sequela. Okay, just management principles, these guys you should know. HLS, reduce the cervical spine. So all our measures are trying to prevent any ongoing neurological injury. So either you want to reduce the spine and prevent the disc or whatever's pushing on the spine, or you want to optimize spinal cord perfusion. Initially, they used to say you want means above 85, but we will take now, I think Failing's latest work says means above 75 are adequate for spinal cord perfusion, but not less than. So for example, with a patient with in some type of spinal shock or patient with low blood pressure, bleeding or some other reason, start anotropes, tell them, patient needs anotropes, I need to maintain the means above 75 because you are trying to preserve that cord function. Okay, and in the next touch, I'll also talk to you guys about in the next section, we'll talk to you about the effects of pressure on the cord. You know, we know that prolonged pressure on the cord has other adverse effects. So you get prolonged pressure, you get ischemia, ischemia, you get edema, you get further destruction of that, the, the, those neurons. So that's why reduction, the basic thing of putting on the cones can get, save the patient a level or even can have results in the patient having full recovery. We've had patients refer to us as Asia A. So Asia A implies you've got nothing. You've got no sphincter and you've got no motor, no sensory below the level of injury. So that is probably a misdiagnosed. But when we see them here, after the reduction, after whatever, they improve and that makes a big difference to the patient you know it's 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 
the spine you're trying to gain. I'll tell you this. When you see patients with cervical trauma, a single level makes a big difference. C6 and C7. C7 is the difference between you being able to transfer out of bed because you need your extension. You need your, extens your extensors to get out of bed and to transfer yourself. Let's say you're, you're you know, you're, you're, you're quiet. So if you've got C7, you can move it out of bed. You're already a bit more independent than a guy with C6 can just flex. You know, C4 and C3, that's life or death. You know, that's like patient with ventilator dependent. C4, some don't need a ventilator. So all those levels, especially in the cervical area, are very important. They mean a lot and they mean a lot for the patient's overall outcome. Okay, so that's the end of cervical um, trauma. Any questions so far? The Zoom guys, anyone? Uh, no, thanks. Okay, cool. Asking a question. Yeah. Uh, the lateral mass fractures of C1, can you pick those up? They don't pick up easily on the open mouth view. But remember, you'll probably either see a displacement, that lateral mass overhang on the one side. Let's say if it's one sided, you may see some overhang. But that's why once you've got an open mouth and it's not looking good, or you again doubt CT scan, yeah. then that, 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 the advance or the advantage of having the trauma unit also so quick to jump for CTs is that now you just say C spine CT and it just will get done. Then you can then you can really see. And just some other things that I think that you guys have, uh, might need to know. You know, I haven't gone into the age of classification, but you must know how to determine what the level of of injury and what their function is. It's like you know, Asia A, Asia B is is got some sensory. C, motor useless, D, motor useful, E, normal. You know, just a way for you to be able to describe how bad is the patient's urological function. But remember last thing before I go to the third columbar, you cannot classify the patient's neurological status until they're out of spinal shock. So therefore you have to do your PR, do your bubble carbonosis refits. And once they're out, then you can say, this person is a C6, or whatever, uh, that's what you, uh, Asia B, and this is what you think can do. The other thing you guys might get asked is the role of steroids. Our unit does not believe in steroids, okay? There's not all that nexus stuff. We say this, the amount of steroids that you require to actually get those intended results is, is very high. And there's just too much, too many side effects from that. So our unit and other units would vary but for this case, Department of Orthopedics spinal unit, which you guys are affiliated to, we don't give steroids for any spinal cord injury patients. Okay. We went to the thoracic lumbar. Again, we'll start with classification. This is just some history for you guys, just for you to know. Important things. In 29, they were just describing the fracture and what they see. In 79, that's when the columns came in. Denis came with a three column. Why are we talking about three columns? Because more than two columns, unstable. You know, and the column, you guys can, is defined from uh, body to middle body, middle body to posterior elements, posterior elements all the way, that's the third column. So that's a good way. If you don't know where to start, go back to Denis. Three columns and decide. Are all three columns involved? Definitely unstable. Two or more columns, unstable. Two, less than two, stable. So already can use the name. McAfee in 1983 came with the, it's three column, but then he added the mechanism. Because in, in that era, that's when we started to see that mechanism plays a big part in deciding how bad is this injury. Then in 1984, the AO came with all together with my girl came with a, with a classification and that we're going to go into because that is now what's universally used. Good inter-observer, it's easy to and it's a nice algorithm to follow. I've added McCormick and Gaines. For those of you who are interested in spines, because you'll hear people talking about, you know, do you need to go front or back or to how do you fix the spine? So what they did, this specifically the McCormick and Gaines, they were trying to decide, because in the old days they didn't have, well it's not so old, but in those times, the instrumentation wasn't 
as strong to hold the severely comminuted fractures. So they created parameters to assess how bad is this fracture configuration and does it front and back. So that is really important for you, but it sort of shows you the evolution of spine surgery and the evolution of instrumentation. Because using this McCormick and Gaines, then you decide while you're fixing the patient, now I have to flip the patient over and fix from the front. So posterior and anterior. Um, it's just some history for you guys to know. And we saw now AO Spine, they published this article in 2020 and it's simple. We know that our current instrumentation has proven that short segment, posterior instrumented fusion alone is sufficient in treating thoracolumbar fractures, even though they've got a high load sharing classification as stipulated by McCormick and Gaines. Okay, so another concept that I've heard you heard me talk about is short segment versus long segment. You guys don't need to know really a lot about that because you're not doing spines yet at those centers, but we're trying to get some spines done at Somerset and Mitchell's and Vic. We're trying to, but uh, hopefully you guys will be here by then. But as I said, I'm also trying to give you information so that you can talk the talk, you know, you can, you guys are affiliated to us. When you're on the phone, you should be confident, be able to talk, and you should be able to talk the talk back to those guys, to the casualty guys, to them, whoever's phoning, you should be able to just give it back to them. Sound like you know what you're talking about, and that will sort of, you know, get them to back off. So here we are with the AO. So just like in the cervical spine, type A is to the specific either posterior or anterior, but specific, we can say one and a half column type of injury, you know? So you've got A0, which is just the minor non-structural fractures. A1 to A4, you're talking about the vertebral body itself. With A1 just being the end plate, A2 being a split of pincer type, A3 being just the comminution, but not involving the inferior, or rather, one end plate only, and A4 is a complete burst, both end plates involving the posterior cortex. So this part is the same for the cervical and for the thoracolumbar. B, it's also the same in that it's either a tension band injury. Is it posterior or is it anterior? Is it a chance, a bony chance, which is the osseous, or is it a osteoligamentous or is it an anterior? So remember something about the chance. The chance can be bony or can be through the disc. Bony chances can heal with no surgery because we know bone on bone, you get a good healing and you get a good, good fixation. Whereas ligamentous can become unstable. So that's got to do with management. Do you need to operate or not? And as I said, when you see a chance, lots of force, lots of energy, okay? And something I'm gonna add here for you guys to start thinking about, there's a difference between a burst and a chance. A burst, the fulcrum, the pressure point is on that vertebral body. So that's why that body explodes. So that force is there, that fulcrum is at that area. Whereas a chance, the fulcrum is in front of the body. That's why it opens up. And like if you look at those pictures, it's opening up. It's not squashed, it's opening up. All right. Then type C is easy. If there's any translation on the lateral, the sagittal, or any view, any translation, it's a type C. Why do we worry about translation and up? Because translation, this is a fixed circular or cylindrical construct, your spine. For any part of it to move out, it means that disruption is not just in one part, it's in all parts, because you can't have something moving if it was still tethered somewhere. So for it to move, especially in the spine, you have lost stability all around. You always be very aware and afraid of type C injuries, okay? Talking more about, about, about these things, the A, B, chance, and, uh, bony or, 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 or ligamentous. When you see this patient 
a B and a C, always be afraid. Thorough neurological exam, because they may seem, especially the B, it may be a B that was a lot worse, that was maybe a C that's now become a, a B again. Just have a high level of suspicion. When you see a B and a C, be afraid and do your thorough exam. Take proper history, find out if there's anything that's, that, that's gone, any neurological symptoms. On your exam, this is where that part of palpating the back goes, because you may have a fracture that looks like an A3 or an A4, but then you feel the back, even though the x-ray is not showing anything, you feel the back and the back you're feeling a big step or you're feeling a big gap or those crepitus. That patient is not an A4, but is actually a B1 or a B2. So depending on what you find. And that makes the patient a lot worse. That just makes the, the diagnosis a lot worse. So be afraid of that patient and combine your clinical and your radiographic to get your answer. Okay, I'll spend some time on this because I think this is the crux of thoracolumbar fractures and, and what to do about them and how to diagnose them, etc. So if you don't have, if you've got any questions, ask them now, because this I sort of do expect you to know because you will have be sending via email, we've got this patient, what do we do? The nice thing we say, I've got this patient and we think he needs this. You know, well, I've assessed him, he's a B2, and we would like to send him across for fixation. As I said, when you speak, when you talk the right language, no one's gonna really be blocking you. And say, oh cool, this guy says he's got a B3, send across. You say I've got a fraction with like an end plate fracture, I'm not sure, what do you think? Firstly, that shows us that you haven't thought or you're not wanting to put in the effort. And as I said at the beginning, you guys are basically registrars. You're in the program, you're on the conveyor belt, you're gonna be here. So if you portray yourself in that manner and you know your stuff, you'll get your, your patients process a lot easier and everything will just work out a lot better. Uh, who, the guys who haven't been to Somerset, Fred will teach you how to, you know, um, to, to do things the right way. So now there's this, uh, this nice algorithm again. Same thing, displacement, translation, C. Any tension, bad injury, B. It's just the body or just the process, A. Use this, let this guide you to the diagnosis and to what you're gonna do. This is important because it will help you decide. Must I send this patient to Khrushchev or not? Called the TLIC score. It helps you decide who gets surgery, who doesn't. So anything less than four, we know doesn't need surgery. Four is the surgeon's choice. More than four needs surgery. Now this thoracolumbar entity is a big problem because there's a lot of controversy. We know if there's neurological injury or neurological symptoms, surgery, yes, you must get sent to critical skill. Now, what do you do with the guys who've got these fractures, who've got no neurological fallout or no neuroscience, any neurological compromise? What do you do about those patients? The truth is majority of them don't need surgery. So now that's why the guys, the AO, they've created, tried to create the scoring system that's gonna help us make a decision. Use it. You, you just say I've got a type whatever, TLX4, TLX5, I think it needs to come across. No one's gonna argue. Just saying those two sentences instead of a whole long thing, no one's gonna argue. Okay. For me, my, as a spine surgeon, my problem is in the four region because that's still dealer's choice. And lots of people can argue, and yeah, a lot of spine surgeons argue, did you fix you? Europe's different, America's different. We are resource limited, so we are also different. I've got a patient from George, multiple fractures, TLX scores like four. We don't have any resources. Stay there in a brace. And you'll see why now, because we're gonna get into all of this part. So I'll simply go through our goals, anatomical reduction, stability, neural decompression. So Raja Sakharan in 2015, try to simplify for us who needs surgery. The obvious one, any neurological injury or problem will need surgery. Even incomplete or those complete spinal cord injury 
or any patient where there's ongoing spinal cord compression, you want to relieve that pressure off. As I've said, fractured dislocation, any type C, whether it's the neck or whatever, that needs surgery because that whole cylinder has been disrupted. There's nothing holding it together. The kyphosis more than 30 degrees. There are some surgeons who will argue on you about that, but you can say that it's because now you are, with the kyphosis more than 30 degrees, you are predicting further collapse and further kyphosis down the line. So you're saying it might be 30 degrees now, but I'm predicting that if I don't operate, it's gonna be 50 degrees and that 50 degrees may have some effects on the neural structures. And then the last one, concomitant injuries necessitating early range of motion. Um, look, that one, you wanna get your patient up, you wanna, there's other injuries, that would, they're gonna be turned multiple times, fix those patients. Just while we're on this part, so we fix patients with complete spinal cord injuries, even though they're aligned. We fix them because every time you turn that patient, you get irritation to that spinal cord. They get autonomic dysreflexia, which can be life-threatening, severe hypertension, tachycardia, they just become, they sweat, they just get all this whole sympathetic, you know, response, which can be life-threatening. So we fix all unstable spines, regardless of their neurological function, to give them stability, to allow nursing, to allow, to prevent the autonomic dysreflexia and basically to improve their life. So as I said, this entity is the worst one. A patient who's got no neurological injury, do we have to fix? No clear answers. As you know, it's literature, there's the guys who can sweat their way, there's the guys who sweat their way. That's why now the AO has started their own multi-center study. It's a prospective level one thing, comparing surgical versus non-surgical, clinical outcome, lots of stuff is gonna come out of this. It's currently ongoing. Hopefully this is gonna give us better answers. I'm looking forward to this because maybe it'll help me answer. Because what's currently out there, there is um, there's no clear answer. But let's time for some questions. I see everyone sort of falling asleep, and everyone's like, "Oh, so who's on there?" I don't know any of you guys. Who can I pick? So you know what, guys? You can thank Skulk and Josh. They're the ones who are going to pick you because I don't know any of you. Who can we give this to, Skulk? One of my choices. You're, cho you're choosing. You guys are here, so you can choose. Let's go see if Vibrant's still listening. Vibrant. I'm still here. I'm not listening, but I'm here. <laughs> okay. We've got it. We have a x-rays there. Just tell me AO. Oh, no, no, no. Simple. Not a lot. AO. What would it be? Um, no, you're gonna have to give me some time here. Okay, who was listening to the thing? You are you on call, we can't let you have some assets. Ask someone else who's in the who's at home. It's a C. It's a C. Type C. Fantastic. So now, by saying that, it shows you that you've already got, but now let's talk about it. If I'm sitting in front of you and I have a mock sheet, you'll have to tell me. So you'll go through the whole thing. This is an AP and a lateral. It's showing a Fracture, you can see that 12th rib. So that's 11, I mean, sorry, that's one, two. So there's a dislocation at one, two. You can't say if there's a fracture or not. You can't see that on this view, but it's definitely a type C. Okay, so based on what we've said, is this stable or unstable? Please you. Sorry? Unstable. Unstable, good. So now we wanna go into what we're gonna do for this. Some nice intra-op pictures for you. So that's what it looks like. That little piece there, that's some fecal sac that you can see there. That thing that's curving on underneath. Okay? Everything is destroyed. The posture and is destroyed. This is before cutting. We haven't, we've just cut the skin and cut, but the, the interspinous ligament was disrupted on its own. Everything is disrupted on its own. We've just cleaned away all the gunk that's around it to expose. So you can see this, 
There's no way this guy's neurologically intact. Okay, the canal is there. The neural elements are looking at you. So this guy needs to be fixed. This is not for you guys to know, but we use a principle of two above, two below for any unstable fractures. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, moving on. These people here, they decided to go short segment. You can go this. The problem is a phenomenon, we call it uh, windscreen wiping, where you can get, because everything is unstable in that zone, you can get play, coronal translation within that segment. So the rods and stuff stay the same, but they just move. So we wouldn't have done this construct for that fracture. Okay, so now I'm giving many lectures on naming A, Bs, and whatever, but who's the most senior in your, in your... Brad. Brad, what is that? <laughs> um, so it looks like there's just this superior end plate in front. Uh, but, so it's what else? So I'll give you some clues. When you're describing, look at the, so look at the other vertebral bodies, okay? Look at the posterior line of those vertebral bodies. It is concave. Anytime you see a convex or a bulging out posterior body line, yeah. think of a burst type of fracture. So okay. anytime you see that bulging posterior cortex, then this is alluding that it's a burst. And if you look at the other inferior end plate, there's also an element of compression there. So with this, just to give you some more information, with this, let's talk about burst fractures. Its components are, on the AP, you're looking for a widened interpedicular distance. So you're looking at those two pedicles compared to the ones above. Are they widened or not? So that's signs that it's a burst. On the AP, you're looking for flattening of the vertebra. That's also implying that it's been squashed and burst out across. On the lateral, you're looking for the features of the compression. But on the lateral, the hallmark is the, that rounding off or convex appearance of that posterior, um, that posterior vertebral body. So this guy is neurologically intact. He's been in an MVA, he's 27. What do you think we should do for him? So if it's a burst, then you've got two columns involved. So I would think he's probably unstable and needs fixation. Or you can even say, well, you know what, I don't know. Let me refer it to the Telex score. Yeah. So you can, then, you can use Telex to quantify, but this guy with no neurology, I think he falls into a three. Hey? I think he's just a three. So, can you or can't you? Then you can say, okay, let me do a CT scan to help me try to decide. Then you see that on CT. That on CT, you say, okay, there is actually quite a decrease in the spinal canal. All right. You can see that canal diameter has markedly decreased. That burst component that you are seeing that's pushing. That's, that's causing that rounding off that posterior body is actually quite more sinister than you think. So now in this, you can say, should you go for it? Should you not go for it? You can still argue. You can. Um, if it was me, I can say, let's go back one. You can say maybe it's more than 30 degrees. Do I want to fix it at a junction area? That's where now, as I said, this, this entity is very difficult to decide on. Telex, you can push maybe Telex up to four. You say maybe some posture tenderness. I can't tell you if the guy's palpated. But anyway, let's say we decide to fix him. What good signs on this CT? What is a good sign that you see on the CT that says that we, if we fix him, we can even get him better? Anyone know? Um, I think there is no reverse cortical sign, so maybe that's right. That's perfect. 
So that cortex is where it's supposed to be. So that implies that the PLL is intact, okay? The PLL is intact, you can use ligamentotaxis. taxis. You can just distract over that segment and you can push that piece back in. And you see, you've got quite a good reduction. It's not perfect, you'll never get it perfect, but you've got good alignment. That big bump is not as prominent. And as we also know, those bumps will resolve. Majority of them will resolve. And I'll show you down some papers on what you should do. Okay, so then these very smart guys, Cochrane. So they did a Cochrane review, looked meta-analysis of everything, and it was just a whole lot of data they looked at. Should we fix those with no neurological fallout? So this first study was in 2009. They didn't give us any answers. All they found in 2009 was that all, oper all they could guarantee with operation was higher risk, higher chance of complications and a higher chance of needing more surgery and costs, financial. So that's what they found in 2009. Then in 2013, they went and did again. They did a follow-up, another meta-analysis. So the same, another team went and looked at all the latest evidence in 2013, but again, the same conclusion, you know. They can't tell you what's whether surgery or not surgery. There's no answer. Because if they looked at things like pain, functional outcomes, there was no difference. Okay. The only thing that they could scientifically show was costs to the health system. And you are now taking that patient with no major problem. You're putting them at risk of neurological injury, bleeding, infection. So increase in complications. So you know, on the study, we still don't know what to do. So this is just confirming which one. This is the specific study in 2003 that showed that there was more problems and it cost more. Um, this one looked at surgery. You had, you know, a uh, range of better range of motion than, than clinically. However, sorry, a lower range of motion than clinically. However, range of motion did not correlate with impairment. So yeah, you can say that segment is not moving, but functionally, when you look at functional scores, no difference. This other one looked at to say, okay, um, pain, surgery had less pain at three months, but after six months, the pain was the same. Then you ask yourself, you know, is it, do you want to get back here? Go ahead. If you want to get back to work earlier, do you want to go through this? But remember, you've got a guy putting pedicle screws five millimeters away from your spine. You know, is it worth doing it? I think I'd want some real, real reasons. Casting. This casting technique is not your normal cast that you get send a patient to Conradi. Conradi braces are good, but they're not this type of close costing hanging where they put the fulcrum directly over. So for this costing, it's very labor intensive. You need a RISA table. There's currently only one, it's at Matron Cottage. You need staff who do this all the time. So a team of at least five people, because you need to cast this patient. You need to put that fulcrum over the, the fracture. But with this, they found that In the patients who had casting, the, cor the corrected kyphosis, it returned to the pre-op levels, number one. 50%, uh, all had 50% resorption of the retropulse bone. So hey, should we operate? 75% of them returned to work. In the terms of the quality of life, 75% of them said they were unrestricted, and 25% that said they were restricted tentative with all the patients. So that then said, okay, we can cost, costume will make our x-rays look beautiful for six months. After a year, how does the x-ray look? You've probably fallen back to what you were. That bone that you thought you're pulling up by, by, by sort of extending the spine, that bone is gonna resolve anyway, 50% of it. So should you cost or not? It wasn't clear. The AO, you can see I'm a big proponent of AO. I think they've got, especially when it comes to spine, I mean, I'm a member of AO spine. 
They've got lots of literature, lots of data related to any question you want to ask. So then they looked at three different studies. And in these studies, they found that there's actually no differences in functional status, physical impairment, patient reported pain, or radiographic measures in costing versus no costing. Then you ask yourself, why do we cost or why do we brace? There's a perceived pain benefit to pain. There's a perceived placebo effect that patients also now, he's got a brace on, he's feeling better, he's feeling more in control. But when you're looking at scientifically, there's no difference. But I will still put my patients in a brace. It allows me to feel better. And I know it's not based on real science because the science doesn't support it. But it'll also make the patient more confident to mobilize and get back and get doing their stuff. So back to our goals. Anatomical reduction. We know this. Okay, in orthopedics, you're going to return it to anatomy. In the spine, why do you want anatomical reduction? Because if you've got kyphosis in a certain area, you then either become a, it's like surgically balanced, you're off balance, you've got a positive balance, you're leaning forward, you have kyphosis. Then what you do, you try and compensate by hyperlodosing the area underneath you to try and get your head back into the neutral alignment. Mechanically, you are loading, your, putting abnormal loads through your spine. They talk about economy of gait. Although it's not proven the fracture setting, we know if you've got a long-standing kyphotic deformity, it's going to affect you later. And as I said, back to this 30 degree thing, it's, it's said that if you've got 30 degrees, you've got a greater chance of progressing. And if you progress, you may then cause further neurological injury, even cause a syrinx. So that's where that 30 came in. They said, well, if you've got 30, your chance of progressing further is higher. So maybe you should fix those at 30. That's still not hard evidence to go for the 30. But we say anatomical reduction. Why? Because if you put the facets on, the facets act as another check ring. So facets lie on top of each other like this. So they're sliding, they're configuration. They're not flat, they're oblique. They lie like this, they hook on each other. So if you put a, a straight structure and you hook the facets back on, you add in some stability. You're improving spine stability. So back to this case, you know, show you what you do by hooking on the facets. You can say, maybe I'll go for a short segment fusion. Okay. But I want to show you something that you guys might think there's nothing. Beware of this x-ray. 21-year-old US tourist in the UK. Complete paraplegic. So already, if this guy comes into your unit and you only see the section, they tell you he's not moving his legs, you know something's wrong. And in orthopedics, we always say two views. So what you're not seeing on the AP, might, you might be seeing on the lateral, one. Another clue is, look at the ribs. Some of those ribs, on some are not right with those ribs. Look at that inferior rib there on the right. Is it, how's its relation to the spine? How's that drip there? So there's little clues that something's going on there. But then you look at your sagittal. That's why your lateral or sagittal is very important. So you can gauge and see the problem. And in this, in this particular one, I want to show you guys what the facets look like. So this is intra -op. The pointer is pointing to the facet. As you can see, in relation to the spine, they, they're more than 60 degrees. They look like they're going straight up. The other piece of the spine that needs to hook, so that cartilage shiny bit, that's the facet. The piece that needs to, needs to hook is under. You know, so you need to go in and literally try and dig it out and lever it out. You try not to take as much of that facet as possible because you can, if you're struggling, you can nibble away that facet but you know you're sacrificing your stability because those that facets are extra check rate, extra stability to the spine. Okay, there's a reduction pointing down. Okay. This is just talking about, you know, stability. 
if there's significant compression, you know, although you've restored it, you can get further loading on that spine because that spine wants as much as it can to go back into that, that level because there's a hole there. You lift up the box, but even with our modern screws, I mean, we don't get this fallout like this. Um, but this can show you what can happen. It wants to tend to deform to back what the rods are bent. You've got wedging of that, that, that vertebra. Um, so just to show you the power of the spine and to show you that we may try to get the anatomy, but even with screws, it tends to want to go back to what, what it, the, the original injury. And sorry, just to go back, this is where that, that, that guy that we were talking about, uh, McCormick at Gaines, this is where they would have said, Oh, I think we need to go on the front and fix and get a better fix. Um, we've gone through this. Oh, important thing, the last thing. May assist with neurological decompression. You know, you're putting it back, just like with your tibia or whatever. By reducing it, you get blood flow back. You get your nerve pressure off the nerves. You get the swelling to decrease. So putting the spine back to where it's supposed to be will help you. Um, with the spinal cord. Neural decompression is controversial because of this line. People, propose, people say it's controversial, say that. Say that injury happened. That spine got the knock at the car accident. So what's the point of rushing them in? But we know, and they also say that you're going to get at least one frankly better improvement despite treatment. But we also know that and I'll show you now with the, the sky work of studies. Ongoing compression has negative sequela on the spinal cord. So even though that initial damage has happened, you can still gain some neurological function or some neural function by removing the compression. So you must try. So for me, the controversy is for you to know about, but for our unit, we know and we believe if you take off the compression, giving the patient a better chance. And it's, when you guys come and you see our ASCII unit, you'll see these guys, they are lying there. They have got, you know, a simple grade, a simple improvement in, 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 in any parameter will make a big difference in their life. So this is just highlighting what we talked about, this reverse cortical sign. For those of you who don't understand it, so the sclerotic part of this body that you can see. If you can look at this area, the sclerotic part, the whitest part is on the inside and it's not supposed to be. It's reversed. So that implies that the PLL is damaged. You cannot do ligamental taxes to reduce this. So if the patient has got this and they've got neurological fallout, you actually have to go in and fish this out. You have to physically go and remove this fragment of bone. Um, so there you can see that cortex. The cortex is supposed to be facing the canal. On this one, the cortex is facing the bone, which is wrong. So all our different approaches of how you can get that piece of bone out, it's not important for you guys. Um, you know, you can go from the side, from any angle, but you'll, you'll see well, it's important when you guys are doing spine stuff. But just to show you how bad things can be with these fractures. There's the one fracture on that side. You can see the destruction, all those MRIs. So when you see, when you look at an MRI, the white is well in a T2 view, the white is the spinal fluid, the black is the actual spinal cord. But if you see any white within the spinal cord, that's increased signal, that sign of edema and injury to the spinal cord. So this patient is toast. Lots of reverse cortical signs in there. You have to manually go and fish all the stuff out. Why this patient is probably complete? Because you're trying to benefit, give them the most benefit and the most function you can give them. Just some lack of pictures, some intra op. This patient would have gone from the side. So that top picture, you can see is the hollow. You can see the spinal cord. But that hollow there is where you've taken out the whole body. And now we'll fill it with the cage and put some screws, some like stuff. There you've got it there. Gone from the side. There's the cage in. Good fix, good hold. Um, anterior versus posterior. 
these guys, they try to do their, what do you call it, uh, ligamentum taxes, but they failed. And the problem is, this patient still has, when you've got an, in think about it this way, you have an incomplete spinal cord injury. When you get off the table, you want to make sure in your mind there's nothing pressing on that cord because you will sleep at night. If he doesn't move tomorrow, is it because I've done enough? Is it still recovering? But if you've taken out everything, you know in your mind there's nothing more surgery to be done. We have to wait for the body to get better on its own. So they left something behind. Um, CT scan shows that, you know, so yeah, just gonna move quickly through these ones. It's almost time to go. Just all examples of all the lack of stuff we could do. Posture fix front and back or front. For this one, you'd go front and I mean, you go, sorry, back, posterior and anterior, anterior lateral. It's a very nice approach. Patients on their side, you go uh, sort of oblique incision, retroperitoneal. So you move everything, all the abdominal contents to the front. The pay while put on the side, gravity helps everything fall away from you. You follow the psoas, psoas takes you to T11, 12. You go up to the psoas, you find your levels, and everything is there. But be careful, there's big snakes there. You've got aorta, eyelid vessels, you've got lots of stuff there. But it's a beautiful surgical approach. At this level, you can see there's a rib there. This level, you've got diaphragm. But if you like operating, this anterior lat is one of my favorite approaches. It's very nice surgically, surgical technique. Okay, back to show this. Yeah, just illustrating, you know, all of these fracture patterns. With neurological injury, you have to do something to them. And with this type of fracture, you can't think there's nothing wrong with this. Even if they phone in this, give you this action, they say the patient's intact, look harder. Look harder. Look for subtle things. Look for subtle things. Look for uh, a conus medullaris syndrome. Look for subtle, look for, um, what's it? Urinary retention. Look for something as subtle as that will catch you out because that's a sign that something's wrong. Okay, the screws. Like a screw, like a fix. Just going through these things quickly for you guys to see. Um, this is what I want to show you. So, this fracture, let's go back to our stuff. This is essentially a ligamentous type. There's fracture in the front, but Someone thought they could manage this non-operatively, you know. And this patient will never, ever be normal. This patient is just going to get worse and worse and worse. When you see that, when you see three-column injury, it's never stable, never stable. When there's no bone at the back to heal, never stable. Even with the bone, you're taking a chance. Even with the bone, I always say, for these fractures, non-operative management, still, and I'm sure Fred and I'm telling you, non-operative management is still management. You still have to check them. You still have to check them in their brace. You still have to do flex six views at some point to see, are they stable? Are they not moving? It's still six weeks follow up, et cetera. Sometimes it's easy just to operate because then you see them or every whatever. Obviously, we're not, uh, not, not uh, I mean, discounting the, the mobility you may bring. If it's unlikely to ever be stable, that's what I've just said, we're talking about ligamentous injuries. So your type B to, you know, that one's most likely will never be stable. It's gone through just ligaments, needs surgery. This one is for the bony, B1, will probably be stable. Just to show you guys there, this is very important. That little red sign, you see that clinical picture? That, let's start at the beaming. In that area, you shouldn't have a little point. It shouldn't be a point. That is a, you know, junctional area. That's where you're going from. Low doses to kyphosis. I mean, nice and smooth. When you see that little red thing and that swelling around it, 
that's a sign of trouble. So back to your examination. Posterior exam, very important. And that's what it looked like inside. You can see something so subtle as you say, but if you felt that guy, you'd have felt the step. If you felt that guy, look at the difference between the spinous processes where they are. You'd feel that there's something going on. There's no way that if you touch this patient, you think this is normal. And if you don't know, you've got the rest of the spine to compare. Put your finger, uh, go down. See, so oh, there's a big gap. You know, it's, it's, it's not that difficult, but you have to turn your patients over. Oh, bony injury, just showing that will become stable. Just so that arrow is just showing you there specifically that um, be careful of see what's happened. Spinous processes, if, if there's a fracture there, so be careful of that or be aware and be cognizant of that. Short segments, not for you guys to know. Short versus long, you, you won't be asked that now. And you think short. But for those of you who are interested, short segment is the way to go because you don't want to, by choosing long, you, you are limiting the function and the mobility of the spine. In the thoracic region, it doesn't matter because there's not a lot of movement that happens. But remember, lots of your spine movement happens in the lumbar region and in the cervical region. Thorax is pretty fixed, so you can go along there. If you're gonna go along in the lumbar, have a good reason, like a type C, then you can go, because you wanna get absolute stability. Um, yeah, I think that's the most important thing you guys should know about that. You might, the smart guys might ask you, or that whole thing that we're not gonna fuse, we're going to fix. In reality, in our system, there's no time for a second operation. If you want to fix, that is you just put in screws to allow, it's like a basically an internal exit. You put in screws, you don't prepare any bony surfaces. You just put in the screws to allow everything to heal. It's a plan to go back six months or a year later. Yes, it's shown that you can still save motion in that segment. However, Another surgical episode, another theater, more problems. No, we don't have time for that. If we're going to operate you, we're probably going to get one operation. But in Europe, they do that. That's why this article that said oh, fusion is not necessary, but it's not relevant to us. Um, some people say rod long, fuse short. It's all different ways of looking at something. My approach, keep it simple. Do I need to fix it? Yes. Do well, I need to fix it? Can I go short? I'm going to go as short as possible. If I don't I have to go along, I know I'm sacrificing and I'll tell that to the patient. Now, how do you get graft in there? Some people have said you can go via the pinnacle to put your graft in the front. Doesn't work. Doesn't, you're just putting little bits of graft through a little ronjo, through a pinnacle, waste of time. Last few slides, we're almost done. This is just to show you, be careful of another entity, the grannies. The grannies are special. Look at that bone. The bone is not supposed to look like that. That's little hollow boxes. There's nothing in those boxes. Okay? You try and put screws in those boxes, you're going to cry. Because you're putting screws. Look at those x -ray. Look at that x -ray. You can see there's nothing in that bone. You can imagine you're putting screws and they're just going to toggle around or they're going to fracture. That's exactly what happened. Fractured below that. You know, just disaster. If you're going to go, well, these grannies are actually go sometimes three above, three below, just to get a better hold. Some guys will say put cement, uh, but um, look, you'll see, you'll learn all the stuff. This is just to give you some interesting, show you the interesting things we can do. What about non operative Thank you. Beautiful. So, Josh has said something very, very smart. And that's where that wrong comes in. You come to me Kodiski, with this. You're not getting an operation. There it. I can see, I can already force you to trouble. However, there's an entity of these patients who are very painful. You can't get up on bed. And in private, funny how things change. It's in private and yeah. The incentive is better. You get paid a lot of money for this. Okay. So some guys go to fix because of that. And they'll use the pain as a big reason to fix. 
Gradient, she is 70, she can't get out of bed, she's stuck in bed. I've had her in bed for a week, she just can't. I need to fix her. Okay? So then you'll say, can you not do stuff like virtual reprosty or calf reprosty? Those who don't know, you can put cement into that fractured body. However, there's certain contraindications. For this particular patient, you can't have in place a fracture because the cement will leak out and cause problems. You want a box that's squashed, but that's still intact for you to put cement. So you can't. I'm going to say put screws and cement into the screws above and below. But that's a lot of work for something that will most of the time heal on its own. So you go back, and I'm sure the surgeon this is not one of my cases. The surgeon who did this felt like shit, started regretting it and regretting it because you see this, then you see this, and you're like, oh, shh. Then you, then you have to go up and down. So a simple thing that could be managed in a brace, granny, you can put it, they've got these nice braces, they're called Jewett type braces, they push back, they keep, you, they keep you extended, they keep you up. Some grannies can't tolerate, but you'd have to convince me a lot. I mean, even if it's a lot of money, I don't think I'll do that. Last few slides. So we've got what looks like a burst, 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 going to the back, went from the side, just to keep it interesting, um, there. And that's the lovely slide, and that's the final slide. Okay, everybody, questions, please.